with David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name, and they waited for a reply. Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered for my sharers and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. Get your swords, was David's reply, as he strapped on his own. Then 400 men started off with David, and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. So I want to drop down to verse 18. Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted green, 100 clusters of raisins and 200 fig cakes. She packed my donkeys and said to the servants, go on ahead, I will follow you shortly. And I will stop there. I will refer to other past, other verses within the passage. So tonight, like, I said, I would not just like to share with us for a while on dealing with difficult people and situations. And as we read a part of the passage, we saw that there was a man by the name of Nabal. And you know, the, the, the Bible is a book that's honest. One of the features of the word of God is honesty. And the description of Nabal is very, very honest. And the writer claims that he was a churlish man. Different versions give us different interpretations of his name. But he was, we are told that his wife, Abigail was sensible and beautiful, but Nabal, he was a descendant of Caleb. He was crude and mean in all of his dealings. So we see, we, we are introduced to the man Nabal. And as I read, David, and his men had been a wall around uh, Nabal, Nabal's sheep, all that Nabal possessed. And the time came when they were in need of food. And when David sent his men to Nabal, his response was horrible. And th this is a scenario that we're dealing with tonight. I want to look at Abigail's response and we as pastors' wives, <clears throat> there is really no template for our roles, for responsibilities that we can go to the word and find. I know many of us would like to think that we can go and find it, and some people think it's actually there. But the Bible does not really make reference to pastors' wives very general references in the epistles to the elders and to what the older women should do. But in terms of what wives of pastors are supposed to do, there is really no template for us. But as we look in the word, we, and, and as we grow, as we have the Lord build a character in us as pastors, wives, and as women of God. We are able to function in the roles that are assigned to us. And different organizations have different roles, but there are really no roles 
biblical roles per se for pastors wives. But as I look at this story of Abigail and Nabal, I see a lot of virtues as Paul's there that we as pastors wives can emulate. And the first of the, the, the virtues that I see in Abigail is her patience. Now, with the description given to Nabal, life would have been very difficult at home. You know, generally, we are on our best behavior when we are outside of the home. But sometimes in the home, because we can relax and be ourselves, we're not really the best. But we are told who Nabal was. And in spite of how difficult it was to have this kind of relationship and this kind of treatment 24 7, Abigail displayed a lot of patience. It put, if we put ourselves in that position, would realize that she had a difficult time. We are not told how long they had been married for, but verse 25 tells us, and I refer to this, what kind of man Nabal was. He was mean, he was a mean man. And yet Abigail seems to have such a gentle nature. She seemed to be so kind. She seemed to have such such a, a, a good temperament in spite of the fact that she lived in a very difficult situation. She was a godly woman who had learned to live with a difficult husband. And she no doubt saw this major challenge as an opportunity for growth. So look at Abigail's patience in dealing with a man like this. And we know that in the Old Testament days, the Holy Spirit moved on people. We know in, in the New Testament days, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. From that time, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, has been dwelling within us. But in the Old Testament, we talk about the Holy Spirit being on someone. And Abigail, Abigail's behavior and response would lead me to believe that she was a very godly woman. And in order to deal with difficult situations, we need to have God living in us. We need to have the fruit of the Spirit manifested in our lives. So Abigail's patience is noteworthy. But then there's something else about Abigail that caused her to, to act in a manner that's praise, that was praiseworthy, and that was her wisdom. One, she understood the threat that her husband's behavior posed. When David got the report from his young men that Nabal had insulted him and insulted them. Immediately, David said, that's it. We are going and we will kill every male in the household. And you know, David's behavior there did not, um, he did not exercise any restraint. And as I think about how David behaved when Saul tried to mistreat him and take his life, David was a very restrained person as he dealt with Saul. Over and over, Saul antagonized David, but David exercised restraint. However, in this situation where he was insulted, by Nabal, after all that they had done for him, David acted first and perhaps thought after. But he got his men together and he said, we are going to just wipe out 
every male of Nabal's household. But Abigail was a wise woman. She understood the threat that husband's behavior posed. And how did she find out? Her servants came to her. And just the mere fact that her servants could come to her and talk with her meant that she was totally opposite in behavior to Nabal. She was a good listener and they knew that when they went to her, that they would not be met with the kind of response and reaction they'd have gotten from Nabal. So she was also very approachable. And as the servants talked with her, her <laughs> heart must have sunk because she realized that the seed of that household was about to be totally destroyed. Now, if that's not a difficult situation for a wife to be told about, I don't know what is. And we see evidence of her wisdom too, because she immediately decided to act. And one of the things that I noticed was that she, she immediately sprang into action. She knew that she could not sit and wonder, was this really true? Were they setting her up? What were they really doing? She, no, she knew her husband and she knew what he was capable of. And she immediately decided she had to do something to avert this disaster. And it was the wisdom that had been given to her over the years as she dealt with a very difficult situation in household. Of course, to have, you know, to know exactly when to act. And wisdom, when as pastors' wives, I believe that God gives us wisdom. Sometimes he says, you need to do something right away. And then sometimes he says, no, just wait, just wait. This one will take a while. You just wait. And Abigail sprang into action. I read the list of all that Abigail had, that she provided, that she packed. I mean, she must have been an energizer bunny for her to get all of that together in such a short space of time. Her wisdom enabled her to be a good organizer. And you know, sometimes when we face emergencies, it's like uh, we lose the ability to act. It's like uh, we don't know what to do. We begin to panic and we sometimes miss moments that could be used to help the situation. But that was not the way that Abigail acted. She had the wisdom of God and she knew what to do and she knew when to do it. it I, I want to also say that she knew when to act, when to speak, when to get the servants to help her, when to leave the house, when to go and intercept David. But later on, and I'm perhaps getting ahead of myself here, when she got home, got back home after meeting David. She did not rush into the house and hold Nabal and um, shake him and do whatever she felt needed to be done. No, she let the night pass because he was drunk and she waited until he was calm, sober, and collected before she uttered a word to him. And all this is evidence of Abigail's wisdom. So we look at Abigail's patience, we look at her wisdom, but we also look at, we see her intervention. Her intervention was timely. And like I said, she, she implemented action to meet the physical need for food. It was a 
appropriate as we read and as you know i've been reading the, the verses in samuel first samuel 25 and i want to encourage you and i know that you would have all read this but i would just like to encourage us to read it again she she spoke to david the words that she spoke to him were prophetic this was not a woman who just sat in the background and didn't know anything. She knew that he had been anointed by God to be the king. Sure, he hadn't ascended to the throne yet, but she knew that he had anoint, been anointed. She also said to him, you know, you, you have a lasting dynasty. How did she know that? And she, she, she knew that um, he had killed Goliath with the sling. And she mentions the, the, the sling and that she would mention a sling there as she spoke to him, meant that she was quite knowledgeable. But her response was prophetic, deeply prophetic as she spoke to David. And you know, when she saw him, she immediately got off a donkey. And she prostrated herself and she began to speak to him. So her intervention was timely. Time was of the essence. Her intervention was appropriate. And her verbal response to him and plea to him was prophetic. But it was also strategic because she saved Nabal from being killed by David. And she saved her household, all of the males in her household. But she also saved David from taking matters into his own hands. That would have been, um, that would have sullied his record when he actually ascended this throne. And as Abigail intervened there, she really became the proverbial scapegoat as she took the blame for Nabal's action. She was humble, she was wise, she was prophetic. She took the blame and David listened to her. Abigail also acted as a mediator and as an intercessor as she stood between Nabal's foolish behavior and David's anger and plan for revenge. So there's Abigail's patience, Abigail's wisdom, Abigail's intervention, and finally, Abigail's reward. After she had spoken to him, very passionate plea, it came from her heart, it came from her spirit, it came from her relationship with God. It came from her knowledge of who God was and what he was going to do through this little, this man who had been a little shepherd boy. As she spoke to him, she said to him, and her eye was on the future. She had a futuristic uh, vision of what happened. And she asked David to remember her after the Lord would have fulfilled his promise to him. Not if, not if by chance the Lord remembers you. She said, remember me, remember me. And she, she was in the midst of a difficult situation, but she never took her eyes off the future. And as she made that statement to him to remember her, David thanked her. He thanked her because he, even though he would have gone and done what he said he would have done, yet he knew that that behavior would not have been pleasing to God and that it would have tarnished his reputation. So he was thankful to her. And we are told that 
well, he would have received everything that she brought and he would have changed his mind by this woman who lived with a difficult man, but served as a mediator and as an intercessor. And as Abigail went back to her home, remember this was a time of celebration and Nabal had this big feast at the house. And the Bible says that he was drunk. And so she just left him. She said nothing to him. And the next morning, when all of the alcohol had gone out of his system and his mind was lucid and he was able to listen to her, she talked with him. And the Bible says that his heart became like, I mean, he, the, the man went into severe shock. He would say he had a stroke. And 10 days later, Nabal died. And after his death, David sent for Abigail and made her his wife. So we see Abigail living in a situation that, is, that was far from ideal, but yet she did not allow this situation to cause her to go into a corner and to throw a pity party. But instead, she continued to develop herself. She continued to have good relationships with the servants so that they were able to come and talk with her. She was able to be a good listener. And as pastors' wives, sometimes we encounter situations that we really, nothing prepared us for some of the things that we encounter. And that is the truth. You know, they, they, they say that pastoring is one of the most stressful jobs that there is. And pastors' wives, we don't always know everything, but we know enough to realize that sometimes some situations are very difficult. You know, I, I remember very early in our ministry, perhaps within the first year, a decision was taken by the, the board of the church. And it, um, it was done with the consensus of the board and somebody's member would have spoken to his wife and then she spoke to another person and then there was a little situation created. And I found out about it and I was very unhappy at what had happened and at what could happen. And when I found out my husband was out of the country, he had taken a group of men to St. Vincent to do some work. And I remember sitting there in my mother's living room. We were building our house and we were living with my mom for a year. And I was sitting there marking papers and my son was probably a year old. And he was there in the living room with me, kicking a balloon, having lots of fun and I'm marking the papers and I'm thinking and praying and worrying, saying, Lord, what will we do? What will happen? And I distinctly heard the Lord say to me that he would work it out. He would work it out. We didn't need, I didn't need to do anything. My husband didn't need to do anything. He would work it out. And I just, I just relaxed in the Lord. And that was to me, that, that was a baptism of fire because I didn't know of that things like those happened. I was oblivious that things like those happened when I was a congregation member. But now that the, the shoes were on the other foot, I was made to realize. So there, there are some difficult situations. And then uh, years later, 
when our church got burnt, that was extremely, extremely difficult. I felt like if a part of me had been violated as it were, that's how deeply I felt. I, I, I was in pain, I was sad. I, it, it was a very, it was a very depressing situation. But you know, I saw the Lord just work it out. It's not that we didn't have difficulties after the church got burnt because we went to a car park and we put some stuff there. We were allowed to use a car park and every time we went back to service, something had been stolen and eventually we found a place to rent. But you know, at the end of it all, God allowed us to build a building that um, far surpassed what we had had before. And God, uh, God developed faith in us. So th those are two difficult situations that we had as we pastored. And only one of them involved conflict. The, of the two that I've mentioned, one involves conflict with, um, you know, an individual or individuals, and the other one, you know, involves all of us. But there are some other difficult situations that pastors' wives sometimes face. One of them is unrealistic expectations on the part of congregation members. And sometimes you, we are expected to be a carbon copy of the previous first lady. And of course, that, that is impossible. But if you're a new pastor's wife, then everyone expects you to be very much like the previous pastor's wife. So that's an unrealistic expectation. There's also intrusive behavior where sometimes um, individuals want to control us and to suggest how we should run our household affairs, inclusive of how our children should behave. And that, that tends to be very difficult for us. And um, Sometimes it almost seems as if particular individuals want to give us a makeover. They want to make us into a particular image, a particular person, which we are not. And then the, the, the last one that I mentioned in terms of difficult situations is where sometimes people try to usurp the roles and the responsibilities of, of the pastor and the pastor's wives and almost make us feel that they can do it better than us and they can show us what to do. So these are some difficult situations. Some of us end up being pastor's wives. For example, I married a teacher who was a football coach. I didn't marry a pastor. <laughs> when I met my husband, he was the sports master to Bible High School and he was a football coach. Right, and, um, but the Lord had been shaping me and he knew that one day I would end up where I did end up and he worked in my life. And I see myself as someone created by God to fulfill God's purpose wherever that road may take me. That's how I see myself. I don't like labels and I am so happy, uh, Angela, that on this platform, we are not using any titles as a tool. Jesus said, just call us friends. Can we just be friends? 
So the, the, the labels, I, I can do without the label. I have some closing thoughts. One, our primary role as pastor's wife is to be a support to the, our spouse spiritually, physically, by being present with him, emotionally, and in other ways. Our first and greatest responsibility is to God and then to our husband. We are not past, we, we are not the wife of the church. We are the wife of the pastor. And sometimes that's all that God wants you to do, to support your husband in every possible way, to be both that Aaron and who. Because sometimes if you're doing a pioneer, work you don't have a lot of people around you and you have to do that for your husband so our, our, our primary role is to support him now god has gifted us in different ways and we use our giftings when necessary but my i see that our primary role is to be a support to our spouse you know, sometimes there are so many things happening in the lives of our husbands. There are so many demands, so many people that they have to meet with. And if when they come home, home is like a haven. Home is a place where they know they can be sheltered from everything that has been bombarding them outside of the home. I think that we would have fulfilled what God wants us to do because our acceptance and support gives our husband wings so that they can fly. Our husbands, are the, he's also our best friend. And there is good communication, which includes honesty and openness. So as pastors' wives, our husbands, yes, we have friends. And never say that we don't need friends. We all need friends and family but her husband is her best friend. And then we keep our eyes on the future. Some difficult situations can be dealt with immediately. And some, some of them, they never go away. But we keep our eyes on the future. 10 years from now, the situation that we feel is so, so difficult it will not really matter. Then we guard our heart so that no root of bitterness springs up. And bitterness is like, a, it starts like a little seed and it begins to grow. And then it gets to be such a big tree that we can't cut it down. And in fact, others are invited to come and sit under it with us. So the Bible tells us to guard our hearts because out of it, Springs the issues of life. A soft answer turns away wrath. And Abigail's response to David, which averted the, the impending disaster, was really an example of a soft answer. Then we choose if and when we deal with difficult situations, both at home and a church, but the choice is ours. And finally, God has made us who we are and continues to shape us into his image. As women of God, he continues to shape us. We are people in process who will never know everything. All of us are, are continue to be students of God students of the world and we continue to learn from others and we know that in the midst of every difficult situation that god continues to be the strength of our heart and the strength of our lives